Welcome to the Power Cat Podcast, presented by Fridge Wholesale Liquor. Now let's go to the Rolling Flint Hills, home of the Cats and Dogs Studio. Here's your host, Tim Fitzgerald. Welcome to this edition of the Power Cat Podcast. I'm having deja vu. I, I swear I recorded the same thing earlier today with two different human beings. But I'm here. Fitz, Cole, and Wally. The other dudes were talking basketball. These guys are here to talk spring football as Kansas. Oh, that, that thing always changes and starts restarting the music. I don't want the music restarted. There's so many bells and whistles. Uh, we're going to talk spring football. We've got some great questions from Wabash Station. We might use them as a framework. We might spin off into the wilderness of spring football. I don't know where we're going with this. I'm tired. I'm cranky. And I get to read the questions today. And I wish I was at Fridge Wholesale Liquor. I mean, not just shopping. I mean, like consuming on the spot, like throwing $20 at the employee and just open up in a six pack right there. I think I get in trouble, but don't do that when you go to the fridge. I could get away with it because you want to know why? Because I run real fast. I'm really fast. You know, Fitz, nice. there's been. I wish Fitz, I could insert sound thing. effects. <laughs> there's there's been this whole thing uh, <clears throat> going on today as we record this on Wednesday. I'm not sure what you're talking about. With uh, with with Barstool Sports and the guy of, of whether or oh. not they're going they're, where they're going to live stream this guy's solitary confinement. Dave Portnoy says it's it's boring. It's bad content. You know. Anyway, it's going back and forth. But it got me thinking. You've kind of been in solitary confinement in the studio all day today. <laughs> no doubt. No <laughs> doubt. And and let's be honest, I could bring up, I mean, I could live stream the whole damn thing. Um, hold on, what am I doing here? Present extra camera. I had it in here, then I had to leave. Share. Um, we'll, we'll bring them in real quick. Um, hold on. crap, I didn't want you guys over there. Uh, add to stage. Oh, yeah, there, that worked great. <laughs> there you there. go. There's your solitary confinement cam. Just get get the back of my head and sleeping dogs. It, it, it looks like dude was shot over there. And I, dude, you okay? Okay, he's dead. That's fine. That's, <laughs> he was he was a good dog while he lasted. Solitary confinement with uh, with unlimited fridge access wouldn't be that bad though. For well, I mean, it, well, just the regular fridge for me. <laughs> 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 if I could have solitary confinement with dogs and and food and booze and a few other things now i would be perfectly happy what about football what well, do i get some kind you of like entertainment yeah watch spring yeah. football k-state no, practice sorry sorry cole not a k-state there will be no none of that no no game no none stream. of that no fun you think uh chris Kleiman let me have a stream cam just hooked up Ooh, the cly cam and i can just get a little gopro and clip it to his vest yes then you hear him and see what he's looking at and you hear him cursing. And then he'd probably start telling jokes about me. I don't want it now. Go to the fridge. That's all I got to say. They're just so wonderful. I, I, I'm passionate about those that advertise with us. And that's why they advertise with us because I, I want them to. I only endorse things in which I truly believe. And I endorse these two guys. They're swell. Let's get going wow. with the questions. I know. It was a lot. Lot. Our friend El Camino Cat, where would we be on the message board some days without, without El Camino Cat? He's sometimes the adult in the room. I, I did a whole DD based on his uh, um, NIT uh, you know, breakdown, uh, all that. Mm -hmm. And then I didn't credit him like mm -hmm. a real prima donna like I am. Anyhow, El Camino Cat has this. Is the focus of spring football at K-State mostly about integrating new arrivals, evaluating young players, working on tweaks of the system. I kind of think it's all that. What do you guys say? Okay. I was going to let go first. Go for I'll it. go first. Okay, sure. I, I was shaking my head to the last one. I think it's tweaks of the system. I really do. Um, they don't add somebody in the transfer portal without knowing what they're getting, right? Like they know what they're going to get in Dante Cephas, or at least they hope that's going to be a guy who's going to come in and uh, – I think at best, I don't think they're counting on him to be a number one or even a number two receiver. I think they want him to be the third receiver um, if all things go well. So they know what they're getting in Dante Cephas. You can throw Jordan Riley, Travis Bates, and some of those other guys they brought in. But I really believe it is tweaks to the system. And Fitz and I were kind of talking about this before we started to record. But like, I, I, I'm of the opinion that this offseason is probably the most important um, they've had 
I don't know, maybe since Chris Kleiman got there, um, they are going to be changing the way they do things. I don't know if you guys had a chance. I know Fitz, you did. Um, Wally, I'm sure you did as well. But when they when they talked and Chris Kleiman talked at his spring press conference about uh, they want to simplify things specifically for the receivers. Um, that kind of struck me. And I kind of want to get your opinion on this because I have a theory that I'm going to come back to. But I, I really do believe this is a we're going to install some things and we're going to change some things um, because they do know what they have with their personnel. You know, I think I think this year is um, is a little bit different because I think in years past, particularly like maybe last year, the the obvious being the year before that when they went to the odd man front and had that that big install of that in the off season. I I would agree probably with you more, Cole, that it it is kind of maybe some schematic tweaks here and there, but I think because we're witnessing the overhaul of the roster, um, probably more so than we've seen in maybe Kleiman's tenure. I think, I think obviously the goal number one that Kleiman says every year is to just come out of spring healthy. But I think number two, it's the development, the progression of, of young players. And when I say young, that could mean freshmen, sophomores in the system, uh, it could also classify just guys that are inexperienced. So yeah. a guy coming from Juco, a guy like Easton Kilty, who has played a lot of college football, but has never played it at Kansas State. So I think this year, it, to me, that's what it's about more than anything is just getting guys developing. And within that development, it's you are evaluating. You're evaluating who looks like they're on the right track, who's not, um, who looks like, you know, midway through spring, they might have one foot in and one foot out into the transfer portal, that sort of thing. So I, I think there's con there's a, a constant state of evaluation and in, in the you know roster management, if you will, a nod to uh, Clint Brown's new role. Mm -hmm. uh, that mm -hmm. is going on all the time, but definitely. And and going back quickly to what you said, Cole, about the wide receivers and simplifying things. I mean, Fitz, this is something we've been talking about. It seems like kind of behind, more behind the scenes than public facing. Um, I tweeted about it probably going back to like the Messingham years. I mean, I can remember the year uh, it was the only year Tyron Howell was on the team and hearing from some insiders that like Tyron Howell was really good in certain situations, particularly like, again, probably what they want Dante Cephas to do kind of those red zone situations when, you know, the field starts to get condensed a little bit and you need a bigger frame wide receiver that can go win a ball in traffic. And Cade Warner, surprisingly enough, kind of in his senior year, took off in that yeah. respect. But this was the year before that, and Cade really wasn't there. But Cade Warner kept playing on every down because Cade Warner was the guy that they knew knew the system in its entirety. And yet, instead of trying to find ways to sprinkle Tyrone Howell in, in situations where it's like, this is a down and distance thing, uh, this would be a perfect matchup that we can get him in, he just didn't really ever see the field. And I think being able to get Matt Wells and Connor Riley to go, okay, in this situation, this would be perfect for Trey Spivey. This is what we, mm -hmm. we just need him to do these, these two or three routes or these two or three things really well. We'll get him on the field for that. We can try and mix and match. So it's not so obvious in week eight that that's the only time we bring him in. But at the same time, I think you've got to start getting these guys feet wet, particularly at the skill positions and fits kudos mm -hmm. to Chris Kleiman for kind of recognizing that they, they need it this year. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I think that what's going on here, offense and defense are two separate things. <clears throat> Excuse me. They end up being both tweaks. They realized during the course of last season, they were often too light on the front three. Uh, and, you know, the, the sad thing is Nate Matlack left because of that when they were going to fix it. Mm -hmm. But he probably also know Mott was coming back and he was going to be the guy that might be the light one. Uh, so we're going to see some more beef out there. We're going to see some four man. They're going to go back to that occasionally. It's not going to be the regular. They're still look. This defense is built to stop the Big Twelve offenses, but now as the it, I love football evolution. I mean, you do one thing, it just stops people. Eventually, people stop doing it and do the opposite thing, and you go back. And I mean, now we're moving into a running era of the the conference, uh, and they want to be prepared to handle that. Offensively, they have a generational quarterback who has a unique set of skills, much like Liam Neeson with a football. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> thank you for that. You're, you're welcome. I was waiting. And he is going to kill people figuratively. Yeah. You know, he's not going to actually do that. That'd be bad. That might be a 15 yard penalty. Um, but yeah, I, I think they're going to try to put things in really layer the offense 
to bring the most threat. The often the best threat in football is the perceived threat, not the real threat. He's going to run it here. He's going to run it here, and to the, to the point where you don't know when he's going to run it because you keep running, um, you know, some zone read and some re reverse things. Is he going to pull the ball back? Is he going to do this? And uh, I think that's what they're working on, and and maybe um, some more option things where. Uh, what I'm talking about is he can roll out and wing it downfield or tuck it and run, you know, let him decide uh, as the play is designed. So I'm, I'm intrigued and I understand why they want to keep it bottled up uh, because there's, there's going to be some new teams on the schedule that have never seen K state. And if they go back and watch film, that's going to be somewhat useless, but you think about it, Chris Kleiman inherited Skylar Thompson. Wally is Skylar a lot like the quarterbacks he had at North Dakota state. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Is Will Howard a lot like those quarterbacks? Yep. Yes. No, Avery Johnson isn't. He's a different beast. And I, I think he recognizes that. And instead of being, this is our offense, you run it, it's going to be what kind of offense will be best for you to run. And I, I think that's where we're headed. And I think there's getting into the simplification of it. I mean, kind of tying what you said, what you guys all said together. Um, I think, Wally, when you are looking at your personnel, there is something to be said for you're looking at your personnel and trying to tinker according to the personnel that you have. Um, Wally, there, there he is. I, I don't know why I did that. That was weird. <laughs> you're, you're trying to tinker to the personnel that you have. And so you have to see, okay, like you said, maybe Dante Cephas is going to be a guy who's going to be able to go catch a ball in the red zone. Uh, or, but we maybe maybe Keegan Johnson's that guy that they need in the middle of the field. Um, so Dante Cephas comes out of the game, right? So it's one of those things where they're, they're trying to tinker. And I don't think that happened. Um, I, even under the last two offensive coordinators, I think Colin Klein deservedly, uh, got the pay raise that he is. He is a rising star. There's no doubt about it, but sometimes I feel like he got a little stuck in his ways with trying to play the guys out there on the field because they knew the offense as opposed to, like you said, Wally, finding roles for other guys. Instead of saying, let's get Trace Bybee, like you said, into the game for this situation, it was, well, if we put him in, they're going to know what's coming, so we're just going to keep the same guys that we have in the game and use that personnel. And I don't think there's necessarily anything wrong with that, but in today's era of college football, tying what you said with the roster management piece in, you have to make every single person on your team feel like they are important because if you don't, they will leave. You're good. El Camino ask, also asks this, without a spring game and with many veterans getting limited reps, is there really anything for fan to be interested in or excited about concerning spring ball? That's a really good question. I, I, I hate spring ball. I, I just I, don't. I, I'm just not into it. Well, it's funny because I, I mean, I was just about to say before you said what you said, I'm not the guy to answer this because you're looking at the guy that DVRs the entire four days of the NFL scouting combine. <laughs> so I love spring football. This is, this is what I live for. for fellas here to me, I don't, if you don't like spring football, this doesn't make you less of a fan, but to me, spring football really is the, the diehards because yeah. it is forget the starters nobody spring football you know and i think getting back to how you know k-state isn't having any sort of public facing um spring event i think a lot of that stems from the idea that people want to come and see starters but i think they would be surprised at how many people there are that are interested in seeing who the two is who the three is who the guy that we thought that's going to be on the two deep is actually running with the force. <laughs> you know what I mean? That that is of intrigue to people. And then at the same time, like if you've got a guy like Avery Johnson, people are going to come out just to stand in line to get that kid's autograph. I don't think anybody cares if he does anything on the field for a spring game. But anyway, getting back to, you know, is there enough like excitement around uh, spring? I, I think there is. And again, I think, Anybody that's on Wabash Station, we are catering to to you, to those people, because yeah. I think our subscribers are the ones that want to know, um, you know, who's winning out in certain jobs. Again, I, we can we've already done it, actually. But I think a lot of people could probably pencil in some starters by now if, or if not, you know, say 80 to 85 percent. But spring ball is so exciting to see again kind of trying to get some buzz about who's looking good, who's running with who. Um, I mean, it, Guys, again, I, I, I shouldn't admit this, but Ryan Lackey already knows because he'll text me about it. I, I, I will go through the highlight plays that they release on social media 
and I will mark down the numbers that are in the, the video because I want to know, okay, that's Avery throwing. So that might be, there's a good case that could be the one offense. Who's he throwing against? That could be the two defense. Who's who's <laughs> out there? Yeah, I, I, I'm a terrible person to ask this to because I, I love spring football. But I definitely think that there is reason to be excited. Again, going back to what I said in the first question, which is if there was ever a year to be excited about it, to want to know what's happening, it's this year because there is, I think, such an overhaul in certain positions and even positions where there isn't a giant overhaul, say wide receiver, where you've got Jace Brown returning, you've got Keegan Johnson returning, you've got a guy like Dante Cephas that you expect to be in the mix and Jaden Jackson Hell, we're equally interested to know what's going on with Trey Spivey. What's mm -hmm. going on um, with Bradley Demps? I mean, there's there's a there's a lot of intrigue. I think if you're willing to look past, the, you know, the the common knowledge, if you will, and and get past that, some of those experienced guys are probably going to sit for good reason <laughs> to stay healthy. The one player you didn't mention was every K State fan's favorite wide receiver, and that's Sterling Lockett. By the Sterling way, Sterling Lockett, of course. There you go. Um, I, I think that. When I look at spring football, it's one of those things. It's like Major League Baseball spring training. You know how like every single time the coach says, oh, he's in the best shape of his life. We're really excited for what he can do. Uh, he's going to be a really big time producer for us this year. If you were to just go to MLB.com and look up any clip from any manager ever and they ask about a specific player, that's what the answer is going to be. Guess what? Guys, if we go ask Chris Kleiman any question about any single player, that's what his answer is going to be. So, like, there is a lot of coach speak, and I get that. But I'm with you, Wally. Like, I, I wish there was a spring game because I think it could generate a lot of interest. And we've talked, I mean, for years on, on, the, on the podcast um, about what they could potentially do. You could tie it in with uh, a, a baseball home series and uh, whatever else they have going on at home, and you make it a big, giant fan festival day you could do that and will they ever do that probably not um but i do think if they had a spring game it would be interesting to see especially because they're at a point now where the recruiting has ticked up enough to where the depth between the twos and the threes are not as noticeable in the past you, there was obviously a difference between yeah. the ones and the twos yeah but now the difference between the twos and the threes is not as noticeable because they are recruiting at a, a higher talented player. Maybe they're not as good on the field, but they have more raw ability. And so the twos and the threes are a lot more equal than they used to be in the past. Okay. My two thoughts. Uh, one um, spring football for me, uh, after covering Bill Snyder for so many years and learning almost nothing and everything you learned seemed to be false. Like this receiver is going to be great. And then you never see him again. Is that uh, it's like that maybe the breakfast food you ate as a child pop tarts maybe let's go with pop tarts let's <laughs> stick with the theme you ate pop tarts every morning as a kid very healthy and uh now that you can either think pop tarts make me feel nostalgic or you can think i never want one of those damn things again that's where i am with spring football i just look i've got trauma from so much nothingness of spring football the other lesson from this conversation here, folks, is if you ever start a business, find yourself a Ryan Wallace that does the stuff and enjoys the stuff. You don't. <laughs> Wally, how long have you been with me now? Uh, I mean, I always tell people that it, from a recruiting standpoint, right, I started kind of uh, right after Bryce Brown. So that was, I want to say 2010, but I was doing some video work with old Shane Howard probably back in 2007. So 15, 16 years. Yeah. That's a long time. I love to party. So um, party. that's for the OGs there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So anyhow, that uh, I, I get what, it. What? I, that's why Wally will tell me stuff. I'm like, I looked at that video. He, he's a Pruder films this stuff. He's breaking it down <laughs> frame by frame. He's, I'm so wrapped into this day. I did the whole magic loogie thing from Seinfeld on Twitter today because of the, all the film stuff going right. on. But yeah, I mean, it's like he just studies everything. And I'm like, yeah, that's a nice throw. <laughs> here's the other thing too just and again kind of this is our chance to vent a little bit about a lack of any kind of i'm just going to call it a spring event because i i think we're past the point we know chris climb is not going to have any sort of scrimmage or a game but some sort of something the other reason i think i'm such a big proponent for it and and i think we might see more of it returning not just at k-state but in the future is what 
what we're sensing, uh, and I say we, I mean, the, the national media is sensing is going to take place with the recruiting calendar. If they start having the ability for kids to sign in June, mm. I think that makes spring official visits more Important. tangible. Um, I, I think it's something that more staffs are going to have to be more open to because the simple fact is June is going to be crunch time for a lot of kids and they're not going to want to be taking visits right up until they're supposed to announce. And therefore, even though the calendar is open right now, you can take official visits in April right now. No coaches want anybody to come in. And I think K-State could be kind of on the forefront of that if they chose to be. Um, they're doing that, get, aren't they? I mean, What's that? Some junior days, and then they have announced a spring game, which you and I went around about. And it's not an official spring game; it's just a the final scrimmage. But they're right, going to have right. visitors then. Yeah, they will have visitors, not of the official variety, yeah. to my knowledge. And okay. I think that's where I think they could maybe get a couple on board and not be so hammered come June. And and if K State doesn't, I would imagine we'll see some other teams that start to do that moving forward. In that way, you're not going into June, you know on pins and needles am i stupid for thinking that they could sell out a spring game yes you're stupid yes yeah there's no way not yes. a no, no no 15k 15 mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. i was gonna Rodford. say is that why maybe they don't want to do an official uh, you know official visits for a spring game is because they don't want recruits to come and see but but you know? here's oh, oh oh here we go i'm but, just asking I, I genuinely am curious here's the thing though when you look at what K-State has done in the past, and I think they're getting a lot better at it, they're starting to have more visitors come in the fall, even though I know they don't want to do that. You want to have the bulk of your class kind of done in the summer. Mm -hmm. um, but again, at the end of the day, K-State might get 50% of their, of their class in June, but they're going to always have to trickle some into the fall. Right. But here's the difference, too, is as, as the calendar keeps moving up, you've now eliminated one of K-State's kind of go-tos that they love to utilize, whether it was Kleiman or Snyder, and that's that December visit. Mm. And to me, it, it makes zero sense to bring a guy in in December, just like I don't know if you really get that much coming on in a June visit because the campus is dead. It's right. empty. In June, there's nobody there, which means the town is what, like half its size? Uh, and then even in December – they were bringing kids in during finals week. It doesn't have the same kind of oomph. Even if you only have 10 to 20,000 people in Manhattan, it gives those kids a taste. It's a reminder. Uh, you can get, I think it would be a great idea in April to get some of the guys that have already seen Manhattan. Um, maybe you get those kind of guys in and, and worry about some of your unofficial visitors being from, from out of state. Or maybe you go vice versa. I mean, I don't know. I think there's you could make cases for for either or about coming in on a spring visit, uh, an official, and, and seeing kind of the campus at a buzz. But you can't tell me that that's not more beneficial in many ways as opposed to June. Because we've heard time and time again that K-State, I mean, they struggle in comparison to other communities to other towns about finding things to do on official visits they can't mm -hmm. take a kid to a top golf they can't take a kid <laughs> somewhere there's not that much to do so why not at least have people around the community <clears throat> when you're taking them out to dinner yeah, when you're having them walk around campus i mean anyway i, I could go on on a rant about it thank you more than i already did but i yeah, but i definitely good. think i'm with i'm with fitz i don't know if we'll ever get more than you know 15 what was the prince here was 32 i think I don't know if we'll ever get that back again, but you can't tell me that you couldn't draw 10 to 15, especially in a year like this with Avery Johnson. Well, I, I hate to say this. I, I always find myself regretting to admit this. Ron Prince had it right. Make it more of a festival, make it a big deal. Not just come watch a scrimmage like Bill Snyder did. And Hey, we're going to flip the score at halftime. Woo. That's exciting. <laughs> you know, I mean, he, he would make a real game. They would draft players, have head coaches, and then you'd have a damn Ferris wheel and a tilt a whirl. God, I loved yeah. the tilt a whirl. When I, yeah. was a kid. I loved it. Out in the parking lot, I think it's great. But I, I, Chris Kleiman wants that 15 practice. It's that's what it's about. You get 15 practices. Do you want to give up the last one to put it in public view, where you don't want to put everything in public view, or do you want to have a full on scrimmage and get after it? Um, and that's what he prefers. And so be it. Uh, but yeah, look, just don't. Whatever you do. 
when a kid comes on that official visit, don't have any candy in his room. The NCAA will crush you. I was just going to say that. You Don't do it. You, I think we're telepathic because yes. I literally was going to say, well, now that K-State's best part of their official visits, which is giving the candy, which I'm not making that up. There have been recruits who have said the snack package that K-State offered was better than sure. any other school they visited. That is a real thing. Now, do I think that actually matters? Probably not, but it was something that they were really right. good at, and now they can't do it anymore. Hey, and whatever you do, don't do those photo shoots that we love because we have awesome photos. How many times yeah. have we used a great photo yeah. of a recruit? Now the, the NCAA time. won't allow it. Anyhow, you know what, guys? Uh, we're going along here, so let's just park a break right here, and then we'll come back with more of this PowerCat podcast. And I'm going to call an audible right here in the middle of the show because we can do one really long one, or we can do two football podcasts. We're now going to do two. We'll be right back. We'll be right back after these messages from our sponsors. Please visit the Fridge Wholesale Liquor, located at the corner of Claflin and Westport Road in Manhattan, Kansas. Welcome back to the show. Let's return to the Cats and Dog Studio. Okay, it's Fitz and Wally and Cole, and we're calling an audible here. Uh, we have like seven questions. We're through two, and it took uh, 25 minutes. Well, so I can spring uh, football. I look, look, I'm with you. It's I don't want to cut it short. So what we're going to do is I'm going to use like some of the questions for the podcast that what I'm doing right now. This talking will be on Thursday morning, and then we'll do we'll just roll into another one, and that'll be on Friday morning. Oh, look at that! Well, look at that! Well, let's move on to the second half here as I skip over some questions. <clears throat> that I'm saving for special. Uh, Powercat Ryan wants to know, I'm having a hard time setting real, realistic expectations for the 24 football season. What would you project K-State's 2024 record if Will Howard stayed? Where is it with Avery Johnson? Ooh. Now, what I find interesting about this entire topic, guys, is Will Howard is considered one of the top five or six Heisman candidates by most of the books. And I think that's, you know, what we've long argued that there is elite talent at K-State. It doesn't always have enough elite talent around it. Now, is Will Howard elite as a quarterback? Well, I think right now in the college game, I think we're seeing a reflection that maybe he is. Given those receivers and those running backs at Ohio State, we'll see what happens. But right there with him is Avery Johnson. In the top 12 of most lists for odds for the Heisman Trophy is Avery Johnson. So this isn't just K-State hype. This is college football fever as they've gotten glimpses of this kid and know how special. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll say this. I think Will got too emotional for the ups and downs of being a quarterback at Kansas State. And I think they're better off right now with Avery. But what do you guys think? And um, I'm going with 10-2 and two on the record. I don't know who's going to beat them, but I think they're going to be pretty good. I have a hypothetical question here. Okay. Because you know I love my hypotheticals. Yeah. If they do go ten and two, yeah, yeah, there's a good chance that they're in the college football playoff. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Okay. If K State's in the college football playoff with two losses, I don't know if Avery Johnson is a Heisman candidate. But if they're eleven and one, and they win the Big Twelve, and they get one of those top four buys, there's a real chance that Avery Johnson had such a good season to where he is in that conversation. Because yeah. if right. you just look at, it, I mean, that usually the top teams in the country, the quarterback is has a really good season and is in New York for the Heisman candidate for the Heisman trophy presentation. This, this year was an aberration. It was yet at what an eight and four quarterback, right? But he was so good that, yeah, I mean, and plus he was sec. So all those people voted for. Him. So if that True. is, if that's what, cause I'm, I'm right along in that line and I, I haven't really like dug down into it and looked at all the teams to make my, you know, we had the whole summer to do that. But if <clears throat> K state goes and wins the big 12 championship and they have 10 or more wins, I would, tend to believe Avery Johnson would have a, at least a chance to be um, in the conversation for the Heisman. If Will Howard does anything close to what Ohio State expects him to do and what they expect their team to do, he is going to get that treatment of as long as he stays healthy and keeps that job the entire year. If they're 12-0 and or 11-1 and and in the college football playoff, honestly, probably like they should be, that roster is loaded. Um, he might be there too. How crazy would it be to see Avery Johnson and Will Howard both at the Heisman Trophy presentation? I'm not saying that's going to happen, but if you were to ask me, will one of those two guys be in New York? I don't, I don't know what the odds would be, but I, 
I, I don't think they would be crazy ridiculous to see either one of those two guys in New York at the at the presentation because both of those guys are going to have a chance to be really, really special this year. I need to ask my personal odds maker um, because Kelly could figure out, Kelly and Vegas could figure out the odds based on the odds of either one of them being the winner, mm-hmm. what maybe it would be to be mm-hmm. in New York, There's both of them. That would be interesting. That would be a great prop bet if someone would make it. I don't know. Wally, your thoughts on this? <sighs> I'm going to be <laughs> – the painful realist here. Um, <laughs> it's, it's again. You knew it again, was coming. It's, it's your it's your role with me I'm to balance gonna be, me out. I'm going to be the painful realist here. Here's my thing though: is is like I'm realistic, but in my realism, I, I still think because of the new system, I'm I still could see a path where K State makes the college football playoff. I'm just I I'm not quite there, and this kind of goes against. I know Zach has kind of done some math on it, right? That they kind of need to be double digit wins or at least mm-hmm. nine, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's kind of where they need to be. I think I think nine to me feels like the ceiling for this team. So again, I'm not saying that it's it's unattainable. I'm I'm not quite there yet. And here's here's my thinking on it is for one, I think we should have learned from the years past about when you lose multiple guys. I mean big t- big name, big production guys to the NFL they're very hard to replace. We mm-hmm. did we didn't really learn that with Felix Andrew DK and Juju Brents and Echo Boydo and we we kind of got a taste of that this last year. You you can't replace immediately Cooper Beebe. You can't immediately replace and I love Garrett Oakley. It, he's not going to immediately be Ben Sennett. Um and beyond those guys th- I'm really nervous about the trenches. Uh, I I'm very high on Avery Johnson. I mean, I'm high on DJ Giddens coming back and um, you know, I was more of a Trayshawn Ward guy uh, most of last year, but DJ proved something just like, you know, Carver Willis and those guys proved something too, but can they repeat it? Can Carver Willis come back? Are we, is Carver Willis going to be the Carver Willis at the end of the year? I mean, it we're again, he's a guy that, what is he a junior or senior now, mm-hmm. but kind of by experience standpoint, he's kind of going into year two for me. It, are we going to see the sophomore slump or do we see the more junior and seed in Carver, Carver Willis? Is he he's guilty the real deal? Who's the center? Is it Sam Heck? You know, I love Sam Heck, technically sound as hell. He's also 285 pounds. Um, so, I mean, we we think the world of Avery, but if, if you can't protect Avery and you can't block for DJ, I really worry a little bit about this offense. And Jace Brown's going to be a marked man now. Is Keegan Johnson going to break out, or is he going to be the majority of the Keegan Johnson we saw last year? Is Dante Sivas Kent State Dante Sivas or Penn State Dante Sivas? There's a lot of question marks on offense. I feel fairly good about the defense. I think I'm with Cole. I think there's enough parts on defense. They're going to be pretty damn sound on defense. Mm -hmm. They'll take some experimenting early on to figure that out. But to me, I look at that schedule, guys, and if you're not 4-1 and heading into that first bye – and we're not, you know, if the, we're seeing some offensive sputters a little bit. That middle part of the schedule is so yeah. unforgiving. Going up into the Rockies, I don't care what Colorado is at that point. That's just a different something that K State will. I guess they will have tested it a couple of weeks before at BYU. But that altitude thing is different. At then going the the opposite way. I mean, one of the other longer trips that K State has to take the next week at West Virginia. You come back to a game that a couple of years ago used to be your kind of your your cruise control week, not anymore with KU. And then you go down to Houston that guys, we talked about it last year uh, and they've had to reload a little bit, but that roster as individuals wasn't Mm -hmm. that bad. Their coaching staff just sucked. Well, now they've got a hell of a coach coming in. So again, I'm, I'm, I'm the realist. I'm, I lean more pessimist, but even my pessimism here is still, this is still a seven win team an eight win team. I, I just don't know if they can, get over the hump and get nine, nine to 10. We'll see, but it's, it's all going to be fits on offense. Uh, it all comes down to the offense. I, I agree with all everything you said. Uh, my problem with guessing, you know, predicting a record is I don't have a baseline understanding of some of these opponents. I yeah, just don't, true. I don't yeah. have enough experience with BYU or Colorado or Arizona. All right. And certainly if they run into them in the big 12 championship, Utah, maybe by the end of the season, I will, uh, I, you know, I don't know where those programs are in comparison, but I can tell you if I know the head coach and I know the program like Oklahoma State, 
or West Virginia or Iowa State, I have a pretty good feeling what I'm going to get from those games. I'm really, you know, now that the half the conference is new within the two year period, it's crazy to try to predict these records because you just don't have a proper foundation of understanding about everyone fits together. It's it's going to be a little chaotic at times, I think. So I don't know if this means anything, okay? But K State on the record, they play six teams with either first or second year head coaches at their respective institution. I don't know if that means anything besides the fact that a, they're not used to probably going up against a team like K state. Now you can say the same for whoever K state plays, but I, I think more about like the roster turnover. So again, fits, like, we don't know much about the teams that K state's playing against because a lot of them have brand new head coaches and teams yeah. are completely different. And I'm throwing Tulane and in, into that mix as well, because obviously Willie Fritz goes from Tulane to Houston. But I think that might be a storyline that kind of emerges is like, okay, you're playing Tulane in week two, you're playing Arizona in week three. It's probably a good thing you're playing those schools in week two and week three, as opposed to week 10 and week 11, because they might have figured it out by then. And so I, I think there's something to be said for playing the two lanes in Arizona's early in the season, the Colorado's earlier in the season. Um, you know, obviously you get Houston and, and Arizona state at the back end. Um, not sure that those games are ne necessarily going to be as challenging as the first three that I mentioned. But again, I just think there's something to be said for K state having experience. They have an experienced coaching staff. And as much as we want to talk about the players on the field, K-State's coaching staff right now, I would argue, is, I mean, what, top two mm -hmm. in the Big 12? And I, I'm not sure, you know, maybe top three if you want to throw KU in there as well. Um, but I, I look at Utah, K-State, probably KU, and then Oklahoma State um, as the top four coaching staffs. And other than that, I don't know if it's particularly close. Okay. Are we are we also, though, guys, underestimating to, to an extent the, I don't want to say enormity, um, cause I don't, I don't know the, the, the severity of, of how fresh it's going to be, but the, the, the task that it is, especially for an relatively inexperienced roster to pick up a new offensive set. I mean, it's not going from Courtney, from Courtney Messingham to Colin Klein, where I think <clears throat> some of the, the pre-snap things were different, but at the end of the day, the, the, the blueprint was kind of the same. I mean, this is from at least what we're gathering and we've kind of been told this before, right Fitz, but like, it's going to be different. It might not look remarkably different, but it's going to be different. Well, I think as long as you stay within the basic concepts of your blocking schemes and your language that you're using, the players will adjust. And I'm not opposed to different route trees and things like that. Cause what they're doing isn't exactly great. So, yeah, I can see that. Uh, but getting back to the nature of the question, because of what Ryan Wall said about that offensive line, I much rather have a guy mobile like Avery Johnson. Yes, yes. Oops, you totally whiffed on that block. He whiffed on tackling me. Where, you know, credit to Will Howard, he, he wasn't a big stiff, but, yeah, I mean, you got him in your sights, you got him. Yeah. You might bounce off of him, but you're going to hit him. And Avery is well, hard to find. One more important, real quick, fits that I think, again, lean more where you would say, I, I kind of prefer Avery in this situation. As we saw last year, Will Howard had such a bond with guys like Cade Warner, with Ben Sennett. Those mm -hmm. guys are gone. He would have to kind of develop a rapport during this offseason, whereas a lot of these guys, Jace Brown in particular, he was thrown with Avery Johnson last year while Will Howard was thrown with Ben Sennett. So a lot of these guys – Avery already has that rapport with. It would be a little bit of a transition if Will Howard was still the QB. And I'm going to add this, too, Good. before we move on. You know how Ryan Gilbert does the GPC film study. Right. If you haven't watched that um, on our website, go go check that out for basketball. You got to subscribe. You have to subscribe. You got to subscribe. This is a sales opportunity, Cole, young Sorry, Cole. I need to figure this out. S subscribe to gopowercat.com so you can see um, – Gills is what's his name? I don't yeah, even like that guy. Him. He does uh, a good job. Yeah, does, they're well done. He does Agreed. a good job. And somebody was asking me if we plan on doing that for football. I don't know, but if we did, I can just tell you there will be there will be plays where I will be sitting there saying, "Guess what? The defense did everything they could possibly do, 
And number two, just he just beat him. Oh, he was in a position to sack him, and he made a move, and he made a miss, and he ran ten yards for a touchdown. Yep. Like, up, oh, oh, sorry, that happens. So when you're adjusting to a new offense, it helps to, as Jerome Tang would say, have a dude at quarterback. And K State has one of those guys. I agree. O two cat asks this: What potential contribution would be the single biggest impact to the football team for success in twenty twenty four? This is a tough one, guys, because it can you can go so many different areas. I'm just gonna say this. If K-State somehow has a deep, a legitimate deep threat that can just burn and get past you, they haven't had that since Tyler Lockett. They've had guys that can pretend to be that, but not a real pain in the ass. If someone develops like that and gets downfield and lets Avery stretch it and the safeties have to stay back, I'm buying. I'm I'm buying. If, if you get that kind of receiver play and the safeties have got to be careful and they can't just creep up to keep an eye on Avery, I think it opens up everything for the offense. I kind of agree. Honestly, I, I was thinking what single con- contributor, maybe not contribution. I was going to say a guy like Trace Spivey. I mean, this is a guy who Connor Riley talked about at the bowl prep and I think maybe didn't play more than like two snaps in the bowl game. I don't get it. Uh, so I would hope that he's kind of developing. Um, again, K-State fans, I think it's kind of turned into a thing on Wabash Station. Oh, what's happening with Trace Spivey? Why isn't he playing? I, I think he's going to play. And so if he can turn into somebody who is your uh, a consistent rotational player, that bumps one of those three receivers down to the fourth receiver spot. And if you're running four receiver sets with Jace Brown, Trey Spivey, Keegan Johnson, and Dante Cephas, and Trey Spivey's turned into a legitimate weapon, that is a really good receiving core. So I, I'll say that maybe not just Trey Spivey, but how about just developing a quality fourth receiver? Okay. Ryan Wallace? Yeah, I mean, the, those are all good. Um, low-hanging fruit. I like it. I I agree. I I go back to the interior of the offensive line. I think that's that's going to kind of make or break things for me. So whether you want to talk about it being Sam Hecht, whether you want to talk about it being Hadley Panzer taking that next step, which Chris Kleiman, I believe, just put out there pretty public facing Mm -hmm. uh, the other day. I mean, it was kind of a challenge to Hadley of like, what's Hadley Panzer going to do? Take the next step. He didn't say he's been bad. He just said we need we need him to be the, the dude this year. Um, he's critical. Um, and then I think a lot of people want to talk about TP, about Taylor Protier, but uh, and, and I'm not saying that he, getting his contribution isn't big because of everything he provides on and off the field. But again, giving his injury history, you, you just don't know. Andrew right. Langang is absolutely yeah. enormous for this team. I mean, to me, he solves a litany of problems if he's just a, a dude. I think it allows them to be able to experiment a little bit more with the interior. So I'm going to go Andrew Langang for me. Cause again, I, I go back, I think the defense is pretty well established. We could name some guys on defense, but if you want to talk about the contribution that can, I don't want to say make or break the team, but I mean, really put the pendulum in the right direction. I look at the interior of the offensive line. That's good stuff. And by the way, you, you weren't privy to this because you were, listening or just watching the, the camera on Chris Kleiman. Right. Hadley Panzer was in the room. Mm. And so was Jane Jackson. It was towards the end and, and the players showed up a little bit early and they just, they opened the door and Kenny Lanou just waved him in, just stand there at the side. And, and our guide D Scott Fritch daddy was asking uh, about those players and they were in the room when he answered and Chris didn't know it. <laughs> so I'm glad he didn't say well, that Hadley, he really stinks. So I, mean, you know, I, I had to rewind it though, Fitz, because I was like, "Who did he just talk about?" I mean, it, it was that blunt where I was yeah. like, "Whoa, that's a challenge." Mm-hmm. I loved it, and you're right. I think he's good. he's going to be at center uh, if Line Gang can, you know, step up and do the things we expect, and then then all of a sudden it kind of changes the uh, the feel of this team. It really does. Yeah, you have you have you had Beebs last year. I wouldn't want to be the person that playing left guard. No, now you have as as they call him Bubba, great nickname by the way. Which one's that, Andrew? No, Lang Gang. Yeah, that's right. Or no, not Lang Gang. Um, Hadley. They call him Bubba. I didn't know that. Bubba. I had a friend that called Bubba. I don't know why we ended up calling him Bubba. Shout out to Kevin Muff. Hey, uh, that's it for this edition of the Power Cat Podcast. But don't don't worry, man. Don't we're gonna go make some more magic. In fact, uh, we're not even gonna stop this recording. We're just gonna cut the recording in half. But I do have to do this at the end of the podcast because it's called the ending. 
We'll be back tomorrow with more football talk here at Go Power Cat. This has been a GoPowerCat.com and Spirit Street production. Please support this show by subscribing to this YouTube channel or follow us on your favorite podcast platform.